Good morning and welcome to each one of you. My name is John Whitvliet here from the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship and it is a joy to see all of you here. We are looking forward to a wonderful discussion this morning and I'd like to begin uh, by introducing some dear friends and wonderful contributors to this session. Beginning on the end of the table with Bob Battistini, who is from GIA Publications out of Chicago, though he now lives here in West Michigan, longtime collaborator with us here at Calvin, and we're currently joyfully working on a project together now related to bilingual Spanish and English song. A musician of many years, uh, Roman Catholic parishes, but has served uh, many Protestant hymn and songwriters over the past uh, several years and brings a wonderful perspective to our conversation today. Peter Choi is here from San Francisco, graduate here of Calvin Seminary and a uh, member of our um, teaching faculty here a few years back, now serving at City Church and at the Newbegin House of Studies in San Francisco. Uh, PhD graduate in History of Christianity in America from the uh, University of Notre Dame, where he studied with another one of our panelists, Professor Mark Knoll. So there's a wonderful reunion that is happening here uh, this morning. Also pleased to be able to welcome Joyce Zimmerman, who is here from Dayton, Ohio, member of a Roman Catholic religious community in Dayton, leader of an institute of uh, liturgical studies there, has served in many contexts over the last uh, several decades in worship renewal efforts within the Roman Catholic Church, and also serves as the current president of the North American Academy of Liturgy, and also a member of the Vital Worship Grants Board here at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, and so is back for her probably third or fourth worship symposium. It's very good. David McNutt is here from Wheaton, Illinois. He is serving currently at InterVarsity uh, Publishers, and also is taught a great deal, many courses at Wheaton College um, related to his expertise in uh, systematic theology, and is currently working at uh, a big project at InterVarsity related to publications of material from the Reformation period, Reformation commentary on the Bible, multi-volume work uh, among his many projects there. We're also grateful to welcome Lisa Weaver uh, to uh, this panel. Lisa is a longtime friend of the Worship Institute, serves on our grants advisory board. From the Baptist tradition from New York City, some years ago came here to Calvin College, actually met Joyce Zimmerman, and as a result is completing her PhD at the Catholic University of America in baptismal theology and practice of the early church and so brings a unique perspective. She is uh, one of the few Protestants who attended one of those significant papal masses in Washington, D.C., and brings a unique perspective as we think about the uh, Catholic-Protestant conversation um, uh, over these next uh, few years. Corrine Mogg is a professor here at Calvin College of History. She's the director of the H. Henry Meter Center for Calvin Studies here at Calvin, wonderful friend and colleague since we both joined the faculty at the very same time, 19 years ago, and she is the author of a brand new book that we'll hear about shortly, Lifting Up Hearts to the Lord, wonderful primary sources that help us better understand what worship was really like in Calvin's Geneva. More to come on that soon. And then uh, finally, Professor Mark Knoll, who taught for many years at Wheaton College, published in, in uh, fields of American religious history, but also global Christianity, and a wonderful book uh, that explores the future of Catholic uh, Protestant um, uh, connections and relationships, uh, co-authored book entitled, Is the Reformation Really Over? And so we have a wonderful panel to lead us in uh, insights and reflections today as really people all over the world prepare to mark an occasion in 2017 uh, the 500th anniversary of the beginning, or a beginning, we should say, of the Reformation. But it is the date that sticks in everyone's mind. One of the themes we'll no doubt talk about today are the different contexts in which this event is marked than in the past. And by different contexts, we can explore also how this commemoration will be observed in different parts of the world. And in the room, I know we have people from the Philippines and Mexico and um, uh, Uganda, I believe, different contexts in which this event will be acknowledged and remembered. But we also anticipate this commemoration at a time where, following Vatican II, there have been remarkable conversations, convergence, and increasingly communion 
um, at least small c communion between Catholics and Protestants in a variety of contexts, and in the shadow of remarkable work that has happened in Germany over the past really eight years already in preparing for this, and a current papacy that is a, in, very interested in ecumenical relationships, so that really the very topic we are here talking about this week has been in the newspaper headlines uh, this very week um, re related to the Pope's own commitment to seeking reconciliation and to participating in some of the events that will commemorate the Reformation in 2017. The way we'll proceed this morning is this. Professor Mark Knoll will first begin with a brief history of how the Reformation has been commemorated. Then we'll hear a presentation from Professor Corrine Mag which takes us into her work on worship in Calvin's Geneva and to some of the beautiful details that help us imagine uh, what it was really like, sometimes challenging myths and understandings that we might otherwise have. And then we look forward to engaging the rest of our panelists in a conversation about this uh, commemoration. Will you please join me in thanking this wonderful panel for being here. And then, Mark, if I could ask you to begin. I'd like to uh, extend my thanks to John and his uh, team for the uh, uh, sort of an incredible combination of, of worship enthusiasm and Teutonic detail that goes into making up this uh, conference. Commemorations of the Reformation have always worked in two ways. Even as they have focused on the past and therefore been a work of recovery, They've always reflected preoccupations of the present and so been interested in contemporary uh, concerns. That's taken place century after century for centennial observations of 1517, when Martin Luther probably posted the 95 Theses on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. But it's also been true for other significant dates. So 1483, Luther's birth. 1509, the birth of John Calvin. 1530, the promulgation of the Lutheran's Augsburg Confession. 1563, the first appearance of the Heidelberg Catechism. And there's been uh, other dates as well. But the soon arrival of 2017 offers yet another opportunity to remember what took place half a millennium ago, but it's also a good uh, time to look back and to observe how the other observances at these centennial years ha have gone. And since this is America where it's pays to advertise, I want to say that most of what I'm taking today is from a really fine forthcoming book by Thomas Albert Howard of Valparaiso University called Remembering the Reformation, an Inquiry into the Meanings of Protestantism. So first, how have the centennial observations been observed? By heightening confessional battles. In 1617, Europe was far gone in the fractures that historians now call the confessional age. And Europe was on the cusp of the warfare that would begin in 1618 and continue with a very strong religious element until 1648. In 1617, Calvinists used the anniversary to criticize Lutherans for leading church reform astray. Lutherans responded by defending the last jot and tittle that Luther had uttered in his extraordinarily verbose career. Catholics sniffed in disgust at the spiritual wasteland they saw wherever Protestantism split, spread. There are two in, really interesting items that took place in 1617 to kind of give a flavor for what uh, these kind of observations can do. In 1617, the Pope Paul V decreed an extraordinary jubilee year in order to show and underscore for the heretics who was the really true church 100 years after this crazy monk had gone off the rails in Germany. But in terms of scholarship, it's also interesting that 1617 is the year when uh, Luther's work in posting the 95 Theses first became fixed in historical memory. There are not actually a lot of good contemporary documents for what Luther did exactly toward the end of October, the 1st of November in, in 1517. But from 1617 and those first centenary, centenary commemorations, 
that's been the date and that's been the time of the year when celebrations of the beginning of the Reformation uh, take place. Later uh, commemorations rarely witnessed such intense interconfessional vitriol, but the contentions of 1617 demonstrate that these kind of observances can be an occasion for pulling out the theological long knives. A second possibility is that commemorations bring scholarly advance. There can be a real positive payoff for closer and better understanding of what happened in the bygone days. Let me offer two examples. In 1883, the 500th anniversary of Luther's birth, there began in Germany an editorial project designed to uh, publish a, a well-attested and well-documented and well-interpreted text of Luther's actual works. It began in the small but very important German city of Weimar. And so this has been called the Weimar Ausgabe, the Weimar edition of Luther's works, begun in 1883, finished in the 21st century, 120 big fat volumes. If you're a scholar and you want to work on Luther, the primary text, now you can do it on your iPad, but you used to have to bulk up in order to get these big books off the shelves. But they're a splendid academic result of a commemoration beginning in 1883. In 2009, when scholars gathered in Geneva, Seoul, Grand Rapids, and other centers of the Reformed civilization to celebrate Calvin's semi-millennium, there, there was a similar, smaller, but a similar burst of excellent scholarship. Uh, Jim Brad, a historian at Calvin, contributed to a book called John Calvin Rediscovered, and there were others, Calvin and his influence, John Calvin's impact on church and society, Calvin's American legacy that all represented uh, uh, the stimulus for more and better scholarship that the, the turn of the years, the opportunity to commemorate John Calvin's birth provided for uh, uh, scholarship and, and good learning in, in reformed matters. A third feature of many of the celebrations in the past is what I'm calling Whiggish self-promotion. I have to pause to explain the word Whiggish. In, eight, in 1931, the English Methodist historian, a, a serious Christian person himself, Herbert Butterfield, published a book called The Whig Interpretation of History. And he defined the Whig interpretation of history as accounts of the past, where those who are writing these accounts look back and celebrate the brilliance, the stunning breakthroughs, the genius of people in the past who look like themselves. In other words, the Whig interpretation of history is an interpretation of history that begins where we are now and where we think we have come in our understanding of the world and ourselves and looks back to valorize the people who are heading in our direction. There has been an awful lot of this in the history of celebrations of the Reformation. In 1817, a, a, a crowd, a large crowd of young men who had fought for the different German states in the Napoleonic Wars actually gathered at the Wartburg Castle for the renewal of German nationalism. Many of you will know that the Wartburg Castle is where Martin Luther was taken after he appeared before the Emperor Charles V in 1521. His prince, uh, Frederick the Wise of Saxony, hid him away in the castle. Luther was a very energetic guy. There wasn't any books around, no TV, no internet, internet so he just translated the New Testament in nine weeks <laughs> in, into uh, contemporary German and, and fixed actually the German language more securely than the King James Version did for uh, English. But in 1817, these young men, most of them military veterans, did a lot of drinking, a lot of singing, and a lot of gearing up the idea that Germany needed to be an independent, separate nation governed by itself. And they formed an organization that actually su su survived through the 19th century, working for the unification of Germany. Also in 18. 17, Prussian commemoration of, of Luther produced a bold uh, idealization of what Deutschtum, Germanness, should mean. Prussia was the largest and the most powerful German state, but, but those of you who know anything about 19th century European history know that there were 
dozens, maybe even hundreds of German states, and Prussia at this time, after the humiliations of the Napoleonic Wars, took the lead in the enterprise of bringing Germany together. And for that enterprise, Martin Luther was singled out as the person who began what was good, solid, secure, and long-lastingly influential in the bringing together of all the German-speaking people. In 1917, when the First World War was going on, things in, in some ways got even worse. Martin Luther was considered to be the promoter of a militant spirit willing to sacrifice almost everything for Germany. And there were, in uh, 1917, placards distributed in, in uh, the, the Kaiser's Reich that showed Martin Luther in the middle with Otto von Bismarck, the Prussian prime minister who'd brought Germany together, and General Paul von Hindenburg, the leading German military person fighting against the Allies in 1917. In the Allied world, it was almost the same as those who wanted to promote Luther's legacy and the legacy of the Reformation said, no, 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 no. The road between Martin Luther and modern militaristic Germany somewhere went off the rails and the trajectory led not to militant Germany but to the peace-loving, good, honorable Anglo-Saxon folks who populated Britain and America. So there were real strong efforts in 1917 to say Martin Luther me means the values that Americans hold dear. Martin Luther stands for the values that Britons hold dear, not the values that Germany is fighting for. That, ent that way of treating these historical dates had emerged in the United States in 1883 with the uh, commemoration, a uh, centennial commemoration of Martin Luther's birth, with a whole series of special American observances for what Martin Luther meant for the United States. And these, actually, they're, they're actually hard to read at, at this stage. I'll give you a, a, a sample from only one of these. One of the, the most prominent and most widely uh, recognized speakers about Luther and the United States in 1883 was a, a Unitarian minister by the name of Frederick Hedge. All of you have sung a hymn by Frederick Hedge. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Hedge was a good Luther and German scholar and is the translator of Ein Feste Borg, Luther's great hymn, that is most often used in English language hymn books. So he, he knew better, but this is what he said in his speech on the 400th anniversary of Martin Luther's birth. As a theologian, he taught us little. Instead, the dearest goods of his inheritance, civil independence, spiritual emancipation, individual scope, the large room, the unbound thought, the free pen, Whatever is most characteristic of this New England of our inheritance, we owe to the Saxon reformer whose name we are here to celebrate. To Martin Luther, above all men, we Anglo-Saxons are indebted for national independence and mental freedom. Well, in a word, commemorations of the Reformation have all too often pro propelled history in service to national self-congratulation, or conversely, fueled propaganda aimed at national enemies. Well, there's a fourth possibility, and this one doesn't need any uh, explanation. Money, money, money. It started with medals, statues, bookmarks, pamphlets, other material memorabilia, first produced in 1617 and appearing regularly in every important centennial thereafter. The history of East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, is particularly interesting in this regard. After <clears throat> Germany was divided in the wake of the Second World War, the East Germans set about reconstructing German past with their own heroes. And at first, the great hero out of the past for East German history was Thomas Munzer, 
the leader of peasant rebellions, 1524, 1525, that Luther had excoriated, Thomas Munzer was seen as an, uh, 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 someone who anticipated the rise of the proletariat and a fighter for the classless society that Karl Marx had decreed as of supreme importance. But then, in 1967, in the 400th anniversary of 1517, and especially in 1983, in the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's birth, it turned out that a lot of people from West Germany, from Scandinavia, from the United States, from Britain, wanted to go into East Germany and visit the Luther sites. And they brought cash. <laughs> and by the late 1960s, and especially into the 1980s, East Germany had begun to lag behind economically West Germany, and any infusion of hard money into the economy was a welcome boon. And so, all of a sudden, Martin Luther became not a uh, cat's paw of the bourgeoisie, but someone who led a bourgeois rebellion pointing toward the classless society that Karl Marx had outlined and the German Democratic Republic was now instituting. In 1983, Eric Honecker, uh, the leader of the East German state, also took the lead in the celebration of Luther. And I have actually quotations from him, but they're, they're in such uh, lame um, sort of Marxist verbiage that they, they make no sense. But, but what he was saying is, Martin Luther was our predecessor. We are glad to celebrate him and come with special visas and special travel permits to Wittenberg and Worms and other places where Martin Luther uh, did his thing. 2017, there is again the lure of, in this case, euros. euros. Uh, Maggie, my wife, and I were privileged to visit Wittenberg only about a month ago, and uh, there's nothing there in the, the train station because a big new train station tourist entry point is being built. You can't get into the Schlosskirche, the castle church where Luther nailed the theses because it's being renovated and the rest of the town is gearing up. It's just a little burg in Germany, but the rest of the town is gearing up for what's gonna be an influx of wallets, <laughs> as, as well as an influx of people interested in Martin Luther. A fifth possibility, and one that um, John has already alluded to, and one with uh, real potential, I think, for making a difference this time around, is ecumenical advance. And let me in illustrate the importance of centennial type uh, observances in the promotion of really serious and often productive ecumenical conversation and decision. Many of you will know that one of the great uh, ecumenical documents of, of our day was the Joint Direct Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification between the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation that was signed, as it happened, on October 31st, 1999, in Augsburg, Germany. So signed intentionally on the day in which, at least by historical tradition, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses onto the castle door at, at uh, Wittenberg. But that, that is just the tip of the iceberg. After the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 65, the Vatican set up commissions for official dialogue, and, in, and I would think even more importantly for the entire Christian church, the documents of Vatican II softened the earlier Catholic statements about the Catholic church being the one true church and other churches being completely erroneous to a much uh, more hospitable understanding of true Christianity subsisting in the Catholic church, but with much in other Christian traditions of value, reflecting the glory of Christ, and actually giving Catholics something to study. 1967, the 450th anniversary of 1517, became the occasion for beginning formal dialogue between the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation. 1980, the 450th anniversary of the Augsburg Confession, Several important books were published by Catholics extolling the confession as a valid Christian statement 
of great service to the Catholic Church as well as to Lutherans. 1983, the 500th anniversary of Luther's birth, the Luther Roman Catholic Dialogue published a book, Martin Luther, Witness to the Truth. And on December 11th, in 1983, Pope John Paul II came to the one Lutheran church in Rome and gave fraternal greetings from the Vatican to the Lutherans. And then in 1995, John Paul II issued the encyclical Ut Unum Sint as an unprecedented move toward Christian unity in, in the modern period. And so much else is, was going on in, in these developments after the Second Vatican Council. But one of the things that was happening was the use of celebrations of Reformation events to reconsider, charitably rethink, and move where possible toward more Christian union. So in conclusion, uh, 2017 may be used for heightening theological controversy. It almost certainly is going to be used for some kind of Whiggish self-promotion. It's going to be used for a lot of money grubbing. But we can also hope that there will be solid scholarship and genuine ecumenical advance as well. It's certain that the commemorations of 2017 will more faithfully reflect the aspirations of all major figures of the 16th century, Catholics and Reformed and Anabaptists as well as Lutherans, if careful scholarship, ecumenical, soul searching, and recommitment to the gospel message that lay at the heart of the Reformation wins out over nationalistic hubris, interconfessional warfare, and the desire to make a quick Euro. Thanks. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to be here to speak with you today. Um, as John noted, what we're going to do now is move from this historical overview of past celebrations of the Reformation and go to a particular place and a particular point in time. To do that, we will be using some of the documents coming out of the book that has just come out with Erdman's, Lifting Hearts to the Lord, Worship with John Calvin in 16th Century Geneva. Erdman's is offering this book for $10 at the book table here during the conference. If you want to get your own copy, by all means, uh, go ahead and do that. You should have a photocopy on your tables, and I've included in that one particular document, and we're going to come to that document in a moment. But first of all, come back with me in time. Come back with me in time to 16th century Geneva. So forget Grand Rapids and the snow, okay? We're back in Geneva in the 16th century. And Geneva in the 16th century went through an amazing change from Catholic worship to Reformed worship. And that change happened very, very fast. And what we're going to look at today was how did people actually experience that change? How did they live it? How did they react to it? So, first of all, we have to have a sense of what it might be like to worship as a Catholic in, say, 1525 in Geneva. So first of all, have you ever been, raise your hand if you've been in a nice Catholic European cathedral. Okay, raise your hand, okay. Lots of visitors to cathedrals. Okay, you know what I mean. Big church, lots of images. Okay, if you went for worship in 1525 in Geneva in the Cathedral of Saint-Pierre, the service would be in Latin, okay? And there would be vestments and there would be chanting and there might be incense and candles if it was a high mass. And the focus of the service, the entire focus of the service was on the celebration of the Eucharist, right? And the holy moment when the priest elevates the bread and the wine and they become the body and blood of Christ. Now, another important thing to think about just in terms of imagining what it would be like to be there, the priest faced the altar. In other words, if you think about it, his back is to the congregation. They don't see his face, they see his back. Now to us, that's very off-putting. We might think, hang on, that doesn't work. How do you do that? The thing was, it wasn't so much that the priest had his back to the congregation as that he was facing the altar and therefore offering the celebration in the sight of God. But all the same, think about all these aspects. That was 1525. Now imagine you're in 1565, so 40 years later. And now Geneva is Protestant. A lot of things have changed. The language of worship has changed, not in Latin anymore, but in the vernacular. 
All the images are gone, okay? No more statues, no more frescoes, all of that's out. No candles, no incense, no vestments. The pastor now dresses uh, like a lawyer would dress, in a black robe. No, nothing special about it otherwise. Where in a Catholic mass, the congregation would stand or kneel, now the congregation sits. And where in a Catholic mass, the focus was on the altar, now the focus is on the pulpit. There have been a lot of changes. And what we're going to look at now is how did people actually experience these changes? What was it like? How did they react? So the document I have for, for you is from 1567. 1567. So Calvin has died in 1564. So it's not Calvin. It's after Calvin, three years after Calvin. And you could think of it as a generation, two generations after the start of the Reformation. All right. And this document is an eyewitness report, which is pretty cool. OK, these are the best documents. Historians love eyewitness documents. OK, an eyewitness document from 1567. Now, you need to know a little bit about who wrote this document to be able to assess its value as an eyewitness account. This report is from the pastor of two rural congregations outside Geneva. So it's part of Genevan territory. It's in the countryside. So these are country folk. And this is the pastor's report. Now, it's very important to know, he is not writing to his congregation. He is writing to the next pastor who's going to take over in his community. So it's a pastor to pastor report. That's very important. Because he's writing to his colleague. Okay? He's, not, he's writing about his congregation, not to his congregation. And he's writing from professional to professional, if you want. And a really important thing to know about this particular pastor, Charles Perrault is his name, he was not from the countryside. He was not even from Geneva. He was a Frenchman. So he is a foreigner in this community. He's an educated man in the countryside. He's the pastor of this community. So a lot of different things to think about. Um, when you read this document, you want to read it bearing this background in mind because what Perrault's assumptions might be about his congregation and how they do worship or how they should worship might have as much to do about him and his own professional background and his expectations as about what his congregation really thought or was doing. So just, just bear that in mind. So I'd like you to start by looking at the headings of the document. So if you, you turn the various pages, you can see all the various headings, OK? Uh, you start at the beginning, and there's a heading about the order of the sermon. Uh, Protestants said the sermon when they meant the whole service, just like you said the mass, and you mean the whole service, right? The sermon is the whole worship service on a Sunday or during the week. You turn the page, you get to what one should do on Sundays after the service, preaching services during the week, catechizing, baptisms, marriages, visitation to the sick, more catechism. Okay, a lot of stuff just sort of giving you an outline of a pastor's work, which is kind of cool already to find out about what a pastor might do in the 16th century. That, that's, a, that's a pretty neat thing. Now, there are some points to note, some aspects of reformed worship worth highlighting. And there are perhaps things that you might not expect. Turn to page 70, if you would, for the heading under baptisms. Now, here's something that many reformed people today are not necessarily aware of. In the 16th century in Geneva, reformed baptisms involved godparents. If you thought godparents was a Catholic thing that disappeared at the Reformation, that is just not the case. Look at the first line in that setting. At baptisms, I used to see that the father and the godfather were both standing side by side and that these two and only these two were involved when it came to making the promise to do their Christian duty. If you look at the Lex line, you see what his trouble was because from time to time the women will push in if you don't watch out. Okay, so you got to keep those women in line. But the key thing is there's a father but there's also a godfather. John Calvin was godfather to over 60 different little boys in Geneva, okay? Very common, not unreformed to be a godparent, okay? Kind of important to know these things. Um, you also notice that pastors are there to lead the services, but also play an important role as agents of reconciliation in their community. And this role is part of the regular order of worship. So if you look back a page, two pages on page 68, the section, what one should do on Sundays after the service. 
If you look towards the bottom of that paragraph, it says, if there was any quarrel, I'm reading the last sentence of that section, if there was any quarrel or bad feeling, which those involved were willing to make up in front of the minister, I used to not send the matter to the city, provided the matter was entirely clear and no great harm has been done. Here you see the pastor as an agent of reconciliation. There is a consistory, the consistory is in Geneva, and the consistory deals with most disciplinary aspects, but the pastor has a role in informally reconciling members of his community, and that's important because you want everyone to be in good relations with each other for the celebrations of the Lord's Supper. It's thought of very, very important to have the community uh, in accord, in unity, in harmony with each other before you celebrate the Lord's Supper. So let's now think about challenges together. Just from what I've said so far about the changes in worship, which of these changes do you think would be kind of one of the most difficult ones for congregations to get used to? Okay, there's no right answer here. Just give me an idea. You can raise your hand and say, okay, I think this would be really hard for congregations to get used to this change. What do you think? Go ahead. The language, you'd think that that change would be really challenging. And you're right, for some people, especially for folks who had been very used to the liturgy of the mass and who had those prayers and those words of the service kind of internalized, it was very hard to make that switch. And especially hard, not just for the change in language, but for the change in focus. Because people were not just supposed to hear things in church, but remember them, okay? You have to remember what the sermon was about. If you're not used to doing this and concentrating for an hour and trying to remember what someone was preaching on, this is hard, okay? It's not exactly obvious. Now, when Perrault writes his account here, he lines up a lot of the challenges he sees in his congregation. One of the main challenges he was having was just getting people to come to church at all, okay? It's in the countryside. They're farmers, okay? They have crops to take care of, and they're, they're in the fields, and he acknowledges this. He notes this in his report, okay? You will have to be aware, dear successor, that not everyone comes to church every time, okay? A nursing mothers are allowed not to come, okay? Crying babies in church, not so good. Um, getting people to pay attention, that was really hard. He notes that the congregation gets restless if the sermon goes on too long, Okay, they have hourglasses to measure the time. And he says at the top of the page, you can just see from the bottom of 67 to the top of 68, it was my practice to time the service to last until the last grain of sand had trickled into the bottom of the hourglass, but then to bring it in an end as quickly as I could because people watched out for this and were irritated if it was done otherwise, okay? People want the service to finish. They don't want to keep on sitting here forever and ever. This is hard. More significantly, and probably more seriously, he notes some significant problems of understanding in his congregation. And, and if you notice those headings, there's an awful lot of emphasis on catechizing, getting people to learn what their faith is about and be able to answer questions about their faith. Perrault and other pastors struggled mightily with the challenges of getting pastors to learn and to express what the faith was actually all about. Um, if you look at page 68 towards the bottom, the very last line on 68 onto 69, and again, he's talking to his successor. I would advise the minister not to take his text from those parts of scriptures which are difficult to understand out of context because they are all connected with other passages, as is the case with the epistles of St. Paul. For the people here rarely carry over anything they have learned from one sermon to the next. I think they profit more from the catechizing. Okay, so he's preaching, but he's saying, you've got to bear in mind your audience. They don't get things, and they have a hard time. Now, this is really interesting because implicitly he's critiquing the standard practice of reform preaching, which was to preach sequentially through books of the Bible, right? You start on verse 1 of chapter 1, and you work your way through all that whole book of the Bible. Perrault here is saying it's hard for people. They can't keep it in mind what was said last week and make a connection to what's being said this week. It's not obvious. It's hard for them. Getting people to sing, psalm singing. We think of psalm singing as a hallmark of the Reformation. Didn't go so well in the countryside in 1567. Perrault reports on that. Um, catechizing was hard work. If you look on 69 in the paragraph concerning the order to be observed in catechizing, um, if you look sort of about halfway through, halfway down, it says, 
What is more, I used to explain everything in as brief as simple a way as I could over three or four consecutive Sundays, for there are questions and doctrines in the catechism which one cannot readily teach people for fear of confusing them. Okay, so understanding, basic understanding what the faith is about is not easy for people to understand, in the countryside at least. And if you look on page 70, more of the same, just before the heading on baptism, it is also to be noted that in order to get people to answer properly in the interrogations, in the question and answer of the catechism, you have to put the question to them several times over and also to take care not to vary